Hello and welcome to the Linux lads. Um, I'm back. Most importantly, that's the, that's top top of the news. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, as usual, I'm joined by Connor and Mike, and we also have a special guest today, uh, Mr. Martin Wimpress. How are you, Martin? I'm very well. Thank you for having me on. And uh, we have to be extra extra professional because because Martin's here. And I've already stuffed up the intro, so that's fine. But <laughs> I don't know. I, I think anyone that's listened to the Ubuntu podcast knows that there's no professionalism there. <laughs> yeah, it just comes so naturally, which makes us feel even worse, I guess. <laughs> but uh, on to uh, what you guys were up to. So as as, ever, as everybody knows, most importantly, just remind everyone, I wasn't here last week. So uh, <laughs> Connor and Mike uh, attended Og Camp, and Martin, actually. Yeah, uh, we were all at Odd Camp. It was uh, fabulous. Well, I know half of it because I spent half lying in my hotel bed trying not to not to get worse because I was ill. But oh, I, I, uh, it was all right. I mean, I went through a lot of talks. I didn't get to do my social stuff, but I still talked to, talked to some nice people. And um, yeah, I've seen a lot of really good and inspiring talks, and I can only recommend it. Uh, I was going to say, and I did literally the complete opposite. <laughs> where I I I was kind of sleeping in in the in the mornings and then moseying my way down and by the time I moseyed my way down it was already afternoon and I missed most of most of the talks but I did do my dad dab hand of socializing so um uh you could say that I was the yin to to Mike's yang there <laughs> uh, that that he got most of most of the talks and I did the socializing you did the reverse Mike yeah. <laughs> So, <laughs> so Mike, what were the standout talks for you? Well, definitely, I don't know how to pronounce his name, Sheroen or Heroen Button from uh, uh, from Holland. He basically was talking about how he squishes, uh, how he basically what he does. He he is uh, almost sole maintainer of an open source uh, project management management tool. I'm gonna say Open Plan, I think. And he was talking about his life like the guy is incredible. Uh, five kids, two of them disabled, uh, works about 70 hours a day. I, I don't know. Basically, he was talking about burnout, about how he deal with things. Um, I hope it's recorded somewhere. If it is, I'll find it and stick it in the show notes. And I will definitely uh, I will definitely put it there if I can find it. Hopefully, I will. Uh, I'm pretty sure he was on the main stage. So that should be he on will, Dan he was, Lynch's yeah. YouTube channel where all the live stream stuff went. Right, yeah. What about you? What did you What did you enjoy? There was a couple that I really enjoyed, uh, and they were from the same person, and that was Terence Eden and his wife. I've forgotten her name. Terrible. Um, they did a presentation about open benches, which I'd heard about in passing, uh, and it's super niche. Niche, you know, it's um, cataloging all of the memorial benches, um, well, around the UK and and uh, and further abroad as well now, uh, and it's. Um, a bit of cultural preservation that is really in niche but what was nice about it was the sort of social awareness but then also the cool technology that they'd used to put all of this together uh, and Terence also did another presentation around um, SVG and how you can use SVG to do incredible things uh, and he runs a site called Tiny Icons I think it is where they try and create brand icons in less than 1k of you know SVG markup oh wow um, so those were those were sort of niche and very interesting. And then I went to Stuart Ward's talks about OpenStreetMap. I was a bit ignorant about OpenStreetMap. And again, uh, I found that quite inspiring, particularly how OpenStreetMap's being used by um, emergency services around the world where, you know, mapping is poor and they need to get response teams into places. So they're sort of um, try. They've got this initiative called the Missing Maps to try and get communities to map these areas of the world that aren't well mapped so that, you know, emergency response teams and medical aid and what have you can reach people who need oh, it. Yeah. Tad, who we had on the podcast uh, a good while back, um, Tad is a, a friend of ours. He's actually involved in the same project. Um, he's doing uh, uh, mapping for humanitarian purposes in uh, Lesotho. Right. Um, well, not in Lesotho, but doing mapping of Lesotho. Mm -hmm. But uh, 
So I thought that was, yeah, that, that is a very interesting topic as well. Um, it's a real pity I couldn't go this year. Um, I was really looking forward to it, but then at the last moment I found out I had to go on a, a work trip for a week, uh, which overlapped. So sad face, but oh well. There's always next year. Um, at least, at least we'll have, we won't have to go through Manchester Airport next year. Well, you never know, you know. It was two two times in a row we went through Manchester Airport. That that's they're very true. So hopefully, it won't be a third time in a row. Yeah, airport is a strong word. <laughs> well, it's the second word, second worst airport I've ever 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 found after Prague, and that's something. Yeah, Prague must be pretty bad because. <laughs> well, they put the security yeah. to the gates. So, well, enough said about airports. Did you meet any interesting people, Connor? Quite quite a lot of interesting people. Um, I, 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 I hesitate to say that none of them really stand out because it's it was all part of it, which is both a, both a this uh, bad thing on my part that uh, that I wasn't able to remember any key people, but also it's a testament. I see it as a testament to our camp in itself that it's a general vibe of. Everyone is massively friendly. Everyone is is up for a conversation. Um, oh, and actually, one one person does bring into mind was uh, Zebedee Boss from from um, mm. from Destination Linux. So I was quite glad to meet him, and uh, ended up having like an hour long conversation over a couple of pints and kind of seeing him the next day, um, meeting up for lunch and in the hotel and everything. So it was always, it was good to see him. Um, and of course it's always good to see the likes of, um, yourself, Martin and also, uh, Alan Pope as well. So it's always good to see the, the familiar faces as well as the new faces. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I've definitely left with a few more friends than I had going into a camp this year and it was great to catch up with the people that you know and leave uh knowing people that you didn't know before the weekend it's it's kind of nice because you don't have to explain yourself when you guys at the week before i was at UbuCon, and it's the same kind of thing right they're all um you know ubuntu stroke linux open source free software nerds and you can switch between conversations. You can be having a perfectly normal conversation about, you know, family dynamics and friends and stuff that's going on in your life. And then immediately switch to kernel page and everyone knows. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, odd camps like that, you know, you can have this mix of, you know, everyone talking normally. And then you can just go into a deep dive about something to do with, you know, something that we all know about. And there's no, no upfront explanation. And I just love that. I just walk into a room and I think, oh, yes, this is these, these are my kind of people. So it's a magic feeling, really, because like in my in my daily life, I know what you mean. You know, like just even around the dinner table or something with my family or something like that. It's uh, it's like, oh, you oh, you have a podcast, Shane, do you? I was like, <laughs> yeah. Oh, what's that about Linux? Oh, what's that? Oh, well, it's a computer operating system. Oh, what's an operating system? <laughs> 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 oh, computer things. <laughs> um. Before we go any further, um, we have a coupon code for our listeners for Azure VPN. Uh, that's a coupon code that gets you 30% off when you pay for three months of Azure VPN. They're a security-focused VPN provider based in Sweden where the law doesn't require them to log traffic. They operate servers in Europe and North America, and their servers are wholly owned by themselves and they're not rented. They're installed on location by their own engineers, and they run Debian Linux. They provide a WireGuard and open VPN option, and the client is GPL version 2 licensed, and it's, of course, available on Linux. They take all major payment methods, including cryptocurrency, and you don't even have to give them your email address. Use the code LinuxLads when ordering, all one word. Make sure you hit the green add code button to get the discount, and that's valid until the 1st of January 2020. So, um, I think we'll get straight into the news. Um... So uh, first up, we've got some good news here. The Document Foundation supports Gnome Foundation fight against a patent troll. So I believe we spoke about the patent troll a couple of weeks ago. The uh, uh, I, It could be something different now. Oh, no, yeah, it was, of course, yeah, Shotwell, the photo, uh, photo management software was hit by a patent troll. So uh, the Document Foundation have thrown in their support. So uh, have you guys read, read about this? Well, I'm familiar with the patent case, but I didn't know until just now that the document 
documentation document foundation was standing behind gnome but i kind of sp suppose that's expected i mean uh, you know it was inevitable that gnome are going to fight this even though the most co cost effective option is to not fight this legally but to just settle but when you do that you set a precedent so everybody else that this this um you know patent litigation is going after or they want to go after in the future now has a, a case that they can cite where somebody basically endorsed their bogus claim so this is why you can't settle with patent trolls because it then makes it harder for the next organizations to you know claim again you know counterclaim so it stands to reason that LibreOffice, you know, they're a stand-up organisation. They care about people's, you know, freedoms, their rights, and uh, it makes sense that they're they're aligned with this. It's pretty admirable. It's going to cost a lot of money, though. I think. Uh, well, I don't know actually how the system works. I just hope that when they win the case, and I hope it's a win, uh, that they get the money back from the trolls, and hopefully it will sink the troll. I'm not usually so mean and vindictive, but when I see these people, I don't know. It made me say a C world, the dirt C world, C word, last time. So I know I'm still behind that C word because this is just uh, the lowest of the low and uh, good on any open source project that comes forward. It's not, you know, the story isn't much. It just says we stay behind GNOME, and uh, but them saying that and releasing it to the press basically means that keep a, people keep talking about it because I'm sure there's a fundraising drive that needs to be perpetuated and uh, it's good that every now and then we definitely will keep mentioning it because that's something that is very important to the community as a whole. Yeah, I think it's going to require a constant top up of goodwill and money from the community because a lot of people have donated to this effort to the Gnome Foundation to fight this. But whatever you've contributed now, I'm pretty certain won't be enough and there will, there will have to be sort of a continuation of this effort. If if you're not familiar with like, you know, what what a patent troll is and why this is such a, a dirty trick, um, there's a guy called Austin Mayer and he's the author of um, the X-Plane Simulator. And he was um, gone after by patent trolls some years ago, and he decided to fight them. Uh, ultimately, that ended up with him making a, documentation, a documentary called The Patent Scam. But he has a YouTube channel. I'll add the links to that in your show notes afterwards, guys, so you can share that. Um, his YouTube channel has some clips from the Patent Scan documentary that looks at how these organizations operate and, and just the, um, well, frankly corruption that exists in the legal system in west texas that perpetuates the ability for these people to you know go after organizations with very thin cases uh, uh and absolute anonymity an oh, i can't even say it <laughs> anonymously yeah it's it's a real shame you know uh, as, as we discussed a few weeks ago it's um it, it re the system really is set up to allow this to happen um, it's just mm. a pure money gro money grabbing scheme like it's it's nothing more nothing less it's uh yeah it's, it's it's very worrying as well for other projects like i wonder what the implications could be in the in the future how many other of the how many more uh of these pa patents are kind of lying in wait mm. you know how many people are sitting on more i mean we w the silver lining here is I think that we are better, the open source community, the Linux and open source community are better protected from this kind of action today than we were a couple of years ago because of the contributions that Microsoft have made to the um, OSN. So um, that offers some level of protection. And also this particular patent claim is very very weak you know if you read the description of you know uh, sending photos wirelessly and all that sort of thing shotwell doesn't actually do that you know there isn't any wireless code in shotwell as such it's just a photo organizer but that's how these patent scams work you know they find a very vague generic pattern that's been granted by the rights to that and then find everything they can that looks like it kind of fits that and they just go after everyone. Um, next up we have uh, Samsung has officially killed Linux on DeX. So uh, with Android 
10, this will stop working. So uh, just for the uninitiated, Dex was uh, Samsung's, uh, I think it was like their solution for, for docking your phone for like a convergence solution. Do I have that right? Yeah, yeah, yeah it's yeah. it's more or less that was their their whole idea was uh you're a you're kind of a business user and you have uh, your top of the line Samsung Galaxy whatever you put it into a docking station and you can you can have a keyboard and a monitor and mouse hooked up to it and you can you can have your your um your office suite which is running off the phone and you'd have a, a pseudo kind of desktop environment displayed on 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 your on your uh on your work display that you your large monitor that you have uh, connected to the dock and you can t be typing away your emails and your your work documents and everything and then uh take away the phone and you you be off and it's all the one device so that was the, there's been several attempts at it and this was Samsung's late Samsung's version of it essentially yeah, so so I think this is a fairly under the radar story because, I mean, I don't I don't know how many people were relying on this. Have you heard of anyone using Linux on a on on this platform at all? I've only seen it running in the Bluefin offices uh, in London uh, with the guy at Canonical who was working with Samsung in order to get it going. So that's the only time I've seen it in the wild as such, and it never left beta. It was you know something that was being developed but i don't think it, it ever made it as a sort of a finished product yeah i think it was marketed at developers but uh, for it to work as you said you would have to have a top of the uh, line so that means galaxy s9 or 10 i think or maybe the plus and uh, you at that level of professionalism i don't know how many people don't carry laptops with them uh, so I think the adoption numbers probably weren't strong enough for Samsung to carry on with it, and uh, yeah, yeah. I, I for myself, I I I can't see uh, using a phone rather than a laptop in this man. Like you know, in, I I can't see using something like this anytime soon. But mm -hmm. I could be persuaded if it worked really well. I don't think anyone was really is really going to be terribly upset by this news. So, um, but I guess. Since it's a Linux podcast, we have to report whenever Linux is or was on a thing. So it's <laughs> it's definitely something that has to be said. One thing that uh, now the name of the project I do not have to a T off the top of my head. Um, Martin, you may be able to help me here. Is it um, Mirai, Mirai, Mirai OS? Yeah, is the is this continue? community continuation or uh, of of this whole idea of it um and it has a kind of a a debian um this operating system with X, xfc right. w once you dock it into your dock and it would be debian with xfc essentially and then uh uh correct me if i'm wrong but it's i think it it uses the same kernel as as android does so when it's in the phone mode right. it's it's android is running off the kernel and when it's in the dock mode it's essentially debian running off the same kernel or something very similar yeah that's right it's just um you know linux is running in a container on the phone like like e everything is a container these days you know your desktop operating system on your phone is just in a container I mean, <clears throat> imagine this was widely available for a moment. Let's just imagine this was a general facility of Android. Would you use it? Hmm, I might. I mean, if it, it depends on how easy it is to use and how seamless it was. I might. Can you see yourself traveling somewhere without a laptop because you've got your operating system on your phone? Uh, I mean, yeah, if there's somewhere to dock it on the other end that doesn't right. have any data storage of its own, then absolutely. Well, that's the problem, isn't it? Because, uh, like, I took my laptop last time to Okta Ocamp because, because if I need a laptop, I had a laptop. There was no screen or keyboard available for me to plug my phone into. It's simple Even as that, had, maybe, yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And uh, so you, mm. either, you either have a facility which has a screen and a keyboard, and those tend to have computers as well attached to the screens and keyboards or you have a facility where you have neither and then you bring the whole shebang and in that case like yeah you could you could probably bring a smaller screen a phone and a keyboard separately but by by putting that all together you might as well buy yourself a little laptop yeah 
from my point of view, um, something similar has a, a use case, but it's not for a, f- a phone. Um, came across. Uh, obviously, I visit various different site customer sites for an IT, and I see sometimes I see the latest equipment that they're purchasing. I'm not saying it's the latest and greatest equipment that money can buy, but it's the latest. It, it's it's fairly recent equipment, and whether they're Dell houses, Lenovo houses, HP houses. Um, the latest is is the, uh, a Type C docking station where everything is it's just one cable. They plug in the laptop. Um, you get power, you get Ethernet, you get everything through the the Type C connector. So that I was I I, I gen- genuinely I was thinking, whoa, that is interesting. It, um, if if I was gifted, let's say two grand or something like this, so I was I was gifted just disposable income that I could. I say, would I actually replace my? If this is with a fairly far, powerful laptop. Would it replace my desktop computer? And ju- and I have a desktop computer. I have a laptop. Would I combine the two and have a very powerful, expensive laptop? But it means that I have a Type C dock that I can just plug it in. I I would actually I I genuinely would consider that it would just be the financial situation would be would be um giving me pause in relation to that. Now. Same concept, but minimize it down to of something that is phone size. Yes, if the phone is is that as is close to powerful, that is a a laptop replacement in terms of performance. I wouldn't say desktop replacement, but let's say low low powered laptop replacement, and there's no lag or anything like that. I certainly would consider it. Yes, but the the problem is getting that much functionality into something that is phone sized. So. I I've thought about this and I've I've experimented with some of the community things that are available to run, you know, a Linux distro in air quotes on your phone. Um and well, it you, you have to have equipment in order to plug it in and that equipment is a keyboard, sizable peripheral, a mouse, okay, not so bad, and a monitor, actually quite big. So they're not things you're going to carry around. So you're dependent on those things existing where you're going. So consequently, I don't think you would ever leave without some other device, you know, because you couldn't guarantee on where you can plug your phone into. Or at least you can't today. Um, I've got really quite interested in these sort of ultra mobile PCs that the likes of GPD have sort of repopularized in recent years, kind of like the uh, the rebirth of the netbook movement from sort of 10 years ago. So these are, you know, sub notebook form factor devices and they've got quad core, you know, albeit, you know, um, sort of um, <clears throat> low power Intel quad core CPUs somewhere between 4, 8 and 16 gigs of RAM, 128 to 512 gigs of storage. And in some cases now NVMe high resolution, you know, full HD or higher resolution displays all in something between sort of nine inch and six inch form factor. And I've been carrying those around in addition to my regular laptop and my phone. And I'm getting to the point now where when I travel, I'm actually going to stop taking like a full size laptop with me as a backup and just rely on these smaller devices. Because when I want an actual computer, it's really the keyboard and the screen that I'm after, because what I want to do suits that interface in some way. And even for SSHing into a server, for example, a screen, the keyboard's way better than, you know, fiddling around on your phone. And these things have eight to 10 hours of battery high resolution displays and they're tiny you know they're smaller than you know an ipad mini in some cases so i'm i'm really keen on this sort of new wave of like the netbook movement they're not called netbooks anymore they call them umpcs but i really love these devices um uh, and i'm fortunate enough to have you know several of them to choose from although my daughter often comes into my office and steals them because she thinks they're terrific as well (laughs) yeah a miniature anything is cool isn't it like <laughs> yeah, to a kid especially yeah. i've i've not had these specific devices that martin is referencing but i i do own one of the a, a gpd product which is the gpd win 2 um 
I purchased it uh, at at the time, and unfortunately, I the uh, my idea is that it would be a portable emulator machine, to kind of on my commute and everything. But I I tend to list kind of listen to podcasts on my commute rather than bring it with me. But I can attest to the build quality and the battery life. Uh, it gets about ten hours battery life. It's very powerful. Um, in fact, there's a quite powerful fan on it because of the of the of the hardware that's that's in it. So the pan the the um, fan actually spins up quite a bit. But it's it, immensely powerful. I mean, uh, you can feel like if your if your finger is too close to the fan, you can f- literally feel your finger getting cool because the fan is is pretty powerful. Yeah. Um, but that that form factor uh came with with uh with Windows ten is now running Ubuntu Mate and it just seems to work. Brilliant. Yeah, I mean, I remember you telling me about the GPD Win. So. I've sort of got this informal relationship with the GPD whereby they send me a device and in return I send them firmware. <laughs> and the GPD Win 2 was one of those devices that um, I hadn't worked on and they've just refreshed that, or say just a couple of months ago, they refreshed it uh, and they sent me one. So there is uh, an image you can download from the Ubuntu Mate website specific for the, the GPD Win 2. Oh, brilliant. What I really like about that that you've you've not described is that when you flip that one open it's a 720p screen it's got a, a sort of a condensed sort of blackberry style keyboard and then above it an xbox 360 controller compatible yeah. uh you know game controller so you like you say you can put your emulators on it and you're not too taxing games from steam and it's a portable gaming pc and it's actually really very good um, and I remember when we spoke about it some time yes. ago, there was an issue with getting the controller to work. Well, that's all fixed now. So, you know, that, that toggle that just flips between the controller being a, an emulator sort of mouse to a, an actual controller, that toggle works seamlessly. I, I love that device. Unfortunately, so does my daughter, so I hardly ever see it. Yeah, the, the gaming aspect is definitely something that, that interested me because I find it so hard to find time to play video games. So I think having one of those tiny little PCs with specific game controls and everything would just be magic. Yeah, it's a great little, it's a cracking little device. I I really like it. My specific issue, um, it was, well, I'm not saying it was just, wasn't working out of the box, but it was a very simple fix at the time. You're now it's saying that it's, it's, it's fixed, is fixed out of the box, but I think it was just installing something extra. I think it was XPad or something. They just, yeah, it was the DKMS module for XPad because at the time the kernel, uh, controller driver didn't uh, uh, recognize the USB ID for that device as an Xbox controller, and now it does. So next up uh, in the news, uh, BBC has a Tor mirror. So this is actually very fantastic news, in my opinion, anyway. It, they actually published their website, their news website, through the Tor network to help people access it in restrictive regimes where they censor online content and block western sites for instance so uh that's uh that's actually very that's great news and that's a very kind of informed move by bbc it shows kind of a little bit of savvy there which is which is quite interesting real awareness yeah i'm happy not that i need to access uh the bbc through the through the tour relay but i'm very happy that they are doing it not only because it helps the people who need it but also because it helps slightly lift the reputation of tour i mean ever if if you hear it from about tour in major media it's always about drugs and other crimes and everything's very bad about it so they have worse reputation and cody for this and uh, i think uh, the endorsement by something as like mainstream as the beep is uh like it shows the true function and need that we have for this kind of thing and i think the tor project uh like it's, it's something the tor project has long deserved because they do all this amazing stuff and the pile of uh bad reputation that is kind of pushed onto them because of the other people who use this is uh it's like they don't deserve it so this is this is a really good news I think that's the uh, sort of lament of anything that enables sort of uh, some degree of online privacy, though. I mean, we see similar things with or did see similar things with Bitcoin that, oh, well, you know, the problem with Bitcoin is you can have anonymous transactions. Well, then 
not quite anonymous, but that was the spin. Well, in actual fact, if I walk into my corner shop and buy a packet of chewing gum and hand them a £1 coin, that was an anonymous transaction. They have no idea who I am, and I've just made a perfectly legitimate, you know, transaction, and Bitcoin's just the same in that regard. And Tor has sort of been smeared with that brush um, because it has been used by people that are doing nasty stuff. And therefore, you know, Tor is bad because it enables people to do nasty stuff. But, you know, as this points out, it also enables, you know, the syndication of content that would otherwise go unavailable in, you know, regimes there where they're trying to suppress, you know, access to um the rest of the world and the the truth or in what you would hope to be the truth that's going on in the rest of the world yeah and i've just tried it just now uh in the tor browser and uh yeah it it works the the i will put the re, i will put the tor the or the dot onion uh address into our into into our uh show notes and you get uh you know a normal as far as I know, a normal BBC website. Uh, yeah, so that's... One, that's one, thing, one thing I'm not so sure about, though, is that uh, the, in the, the Verge or the site who reported this, but I've noticed in the uh, URL to the news story, they have put dark web. And that's another kind of misnomer that I really don't like because Tor does not equal dark web. Like It's a bit silly. So um, they're kind of promoting that that uh that, that kind of image of tor yeah. just in the reporting it, like it's it's the misappropriation of language um by the media though you know every time you see hacker that they're using that word incorrectly as well you know this is just you know and also cyber that drives me crazy oh, God. <laughs> yeah. we had a conversation with somebody uh recently who worked in information security and the number of times they said cy cyber in the end i just had to get up and walk away because it was it was just too much for me to bear <laughs> yeah the the information super highway <laughs> yeah remember that remember that and cyberspace oh yeah uh <laughs> And webmaster, you would have the web. Oh, I always liked webmaster. The, the, the webmaster and the footer of the website. Yeah, yes. yeah, I like. I always liked that. I liked being the webmaster and the postmaster and, <laughs> and what have you, FTP master. <laughs> it made me feel like I was. I was always terrible at D and D, and when I became a webmaster, I was like, <laughs> <laughs> I am the master of the web. <laughs> None shall pass. I guess it was probably the the same sort of connotation as a headmaster. You know, <laughs> <laughs> the webmaster keeps right. everyone on the website in check. Yeah, I thought all the wrong things when you said that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to ask. <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, kudos to BBC. Nonetheless, that, that's that's great. And I hope other sites start to follow their lead because, um, you know, I, I, I don't know, like Connor and Mike are familiar with this, but Martin, I, I, I prattle on about... Um, digital privacy and online rights and the the, the, the the sort of the activist side of all of this that we talk about all the time. Mm -hmm. um, the, the, the political side of it, I suppose, I hate fucking using that word these days, but still um, the, the, the ethical side, I guess is a better word, but um, yeah, the internet's just being like carved up by corporations and I know that, you know, that's uh, like a very yeah man kind of thing to say, but it's very true that, you know, the internet is very quickly losing its neutrality and its accessibility. And, you know, it's not, it's not, it's not the egalitarian place it used to be. So um, moves like this are always welcome. Yeah. Yeah, it is because this is a positive spin on what Tor is about, and and that that's good that there's a major organisation that's standing behind this for all the right reasons. And it's interesting what you said there about, um, you know, these major organisations that are you know distilling the or you know eroding the neutrality of the internet. I I can't remember what the name of the book was, but there was an operating system back in sort of uh, the 50s, 60s called Multix. It was the for, forerunner to Unix. And at that time, they claimed that 
um, computing would be like a utility, like, you know, water, electricity, or, you know, that kind of utility. And the world would not need more than five computers because you would have this terminal in the home and you would connect to one of these five computers in order to facilitate your computing requirements. And that obviously seems like madness. But to my mind, it was before 4K this is actually... <laughs> <laughs> well, but I think this is I think this is where we're heading, but you just need to slightly expand the concept of what a computer is. Let's imagine that the computer the computers in question are Google, Facebook, Amazon. Uh that's three, you know, PayPal maybe. Uh one other. Should we choose one? Let's say eBay. You know, those five computers in air quotes are all the computing that you need. Um, and they kind of are, because for a lot of people, the first three of those is probably, you know, the majority of what they need from being online. Well, I said it last time, I said it again, war in 2020. <laughs> she, she will show them. Anyway, no, no you are right. Um, it, is, it is like we all have uh, thin clients in our pockets for, for the big terminals that are, that are these massive, uh, massive size that... Uh, take our data as a payment for connectivity or whatever and uh, you know maybe the maybe the people in the 50s were right maybe maybe this is this is all uh, all we need but uh, to me as long as there is a there is a possibility of something else as long as i can go outside of this somewhere where it's not facebook or google or uh, or anybody else uh, I'm I'm kind of happy. I understand why people use Facebook. I don't like using it, and uh, the same for the other ones. But uh, I I don't see basically I don't see them going anywhere anytime soon because people because the consolidation that they bring brings a lot of convenience for people. So uh, it's it's something that people kind of want they want the convenience of being able to connect to relatives halfway around the world so uh and and the rest of it so i i i don't see it being done by the tor hidden service or by distributed services i don't see it being done by anybody who doesn't have doesn't have a massive computing power behind them in my opinion it should be the United Nations or somebody, uh, you know, nationalizing this whole thing and running it as a as a as a as a utility. But uh, that's that's not probably going to happen, and it's more of a pipe dream than anything else. But uh, it, needs, it needs to be decentralized. Like no, nobody has any, no one body has any control. Yeah, I prefer, you know, the Wild West approach, you know, everything's a dump pipe and you get to utilize the interconnectivity uh, um, and everything's, everyone's got a level playing field, you know, because if we start to lock these things down, if we start to have prioritized traffic, it stifles innovation for what could be, you know, the next Twitter or whatever, you know, to, to rise up and I, I hear th the next Twitter is apparently TikTok, though, or something. Uh, yeah. Just, yeah, I think I'm too old for this. <laughs> yeah, I, I think I've officially just passed the, the, the threshold in my life because I never knew when this would actually arrive. Some people, it never arrives, but that threshold in your life where you reach a certain point and you realize, I don't care what young people are into now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm or, getting, getting too old for this shit. Or, <laughs> no, I just, I get, you reach a point where you're like, What's that thing I don't know about? Oh, wait, for, for once in my life, I don't care that I don't know about it. <laughs> it's, 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 it's fine. It's passed me by. That's okay. <laughs> and TikTok is one of those. And so is Snapchat, for Christ's sake. Like I, I had Snapchat for about 10 minutes a few times. And then I was like, nope, this just isn't for me. Just stop trying to get me to use Snapchat. <laughs> And in order news, old man shouts a cloud. <laughs> <laughs> That's going to be on my tombstone. <laughs> Get out of my lawn. Well, you know, but it's it's uh, it's a nice perspective to have, not to have to, uh, not to have to be the slave to every single trend because they are coming fast and they are dying even faster. So it's TikTok today, yeah. and it's going to be something else tomorrow. 
But, uh, you know, back to the point, no, I, I like the dump pipe aspect of it. I just think somebody needs to guarantee it because uh, it's not a natural state. So if you have your ISPs and you have your you have your contact providers, all of these people strive towards not being dump pipes. Uh, so somebody has to somebody has to quite strictly watch this space and uh, ensure that everybody is keeping the field level, the, uh, the playing field level. Uh, but and I think that can only be done by some kind of uh, representation of the people. But I think I'm, I'm, we said that rents are okay, but I think I'm kind of going way too into the woods. So let's pull me back and uh, go somewhere <laughs> someone else. Get the la someone get the lasso for Mike. <laughs> what I was visualizing when when you guys were, were, were talking about the different concepts was kind of a ready player one interface where everyone is kind of puts on a helmet and sure it might be the wild west and they they might uh any anything goes rather than in ready player one it is centralized it is owned by a company and a corporation but there is it it mightn't be a dystopian future and it might be the wild west but then I kind of counteracted that point in my own head when I was thinking it is kind of a, that would be a kind of a dystopian future because sure people are interacting with each other um, and there no one corporation is owning the internet but there is an, an element of escapism because they're putting on their VR headset and it's they're escaping from real real life so I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing, but I guess that was the way my brain was working as you were doing, as you guys were talking. So you mean like, yeah, sure, I live in a discarded portalu, but at least I'm I'm the billionaire playboy in virtual reality. Well, I don't know. I don't think I'd like we'll that. We'll get to that stage. Anyway, I think that's a good place to segue to our next point on the news. Um, what the portaloo right? <laughs> <laughs> It's just I don't I don't really know how to address it, so I think I'll just I'll just, <laughs> le just leave it in the dust. Um, Talking about escapism. <laughs> so next up, very relevant, very on on point news story for us. Um, Ubuntu nineteen ten is out, uh, and also Will Cook is out, and also <laughs> Wimpy is in. Now you were meant to read it that uh, that way. It's one meant. To, yeah, it's well. more fun that way. Yeah. We it <laughs> creates mystery. Um, so yeah, uh, just to explain all those things I said, Ubuntu 1910 is out with experimental support for ZFS on root. Um, ZFS sounds really cool, but I'm still not entirely sure why. Uh, <laughs> Will Cook leaves the desktop team for Influx DB to be replaced by, brrr, drum roll, Martin Wimpress. Hello, congratulations. <laughs> Thank you very much. So uh, my question number one is, so Ubuntu 2004 is the base desktop that's going to be Marte, right? If I had a pound for every time somebody's cracked that joke since uh, yeah, Tuesday I know. last week, I'd I'd have I'd have about seven quid by now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, well, I'm sure. No, there's no, there's there's obviously no plans to change the the default desktop. Um, despite you know what I've been working on, you know, uh, you know personally for for many years now. Um, you know, I'm and and. Some people may not know that, you know, when I was originally hired by Canonical, I was hired onto the desktop team by Will Cook. So, you know, I did work on the Ubuntu desktop. Uh, it's two and a half years ago now. Um, so even back then, you know, I was working on, and at the time it was Unity. <laughs> so, you know, this, this is how much things have changed. So I was working on Unity uh, professionally, and I continued to contribute to Mate and Ubuntu Mate during that period. And... I will continue to do that, uh, even though, you know, in my day job, I'm going to be focused on delivering the best uh, Ubuntu desktop experience on the yeah, GNOME. Before anybody jumps in, I have to, in, uh, in uh, you know, favor of my uh, of the preservation of my marital happiness, I have to express my wife's thank you for Ubuntu Mate. Uh, she, when we met, she used to, she, she had Ubuntu. But she wasn't, it was, we met shortly after uh, Ubuntu switched to Unity. She wasn't very happy with it because she liked the old paradigm of GNOME 2. So I said, well, there's this Mate thing and installed it. And she's been using it ever since. So, uh, yeah, she says thank you. 
Well, that, that's lovely to hear. Thank you for sharing that. I find that Ubuntu Mate is particularly well suited for uh, wives and parents because that's who I originally created it for. <laughs> it was it was my wife and my, my parents and my in-laws who I'd switched to Linux some years before. They're not particularly technically minded. They don't want to have to relearn how to use their computer. They just wanted things back the way they'd always been, you know, shaking their fist at that cloud again. <laughs> um, and that's how I got started on that project. But, you know, uh, at the time, I was perfectly happy using um, GNOME 3, even though it was quite embryonic back then. I think this is in the era of like, you know, 3.6, something like that, you know, GNOME 3.6. And it was very definitely far from finished back then, but I was happy with it. Um, but then again, you know, I'm a Linux desktop romantic. So, you know, I, uh, I'm i pretty much happy with any uh, Linux desktop operating system. Uh, but yeah, I'm, I'm really delighted to be back on the Ubuntu desktop team, I have to say. Do you, are there any priorities that you are going to change or anything that you, that they will start doing differently from now on or? Uh, no, I think it's unwise. You know, when, if if you're a manager of a a manager and you come into a team, I think it's unwise to just wholesale start changing things left, right, and centre. I think that's a really bad form. I think what's best to do is look at what the team are doing well, and there's a lot that the Ubuntu desktop team are doing well, and let them continue doing great things, and then observe and see if there's anything that you can see as you know stuff that you would be personally interested in in doing. And, you know, right now we've just got a 1910 release out the door. You know, for the last five years, Will has been steering Ubuntu through some some tricky territory, you know, through those Unity years, that whole um, migration from Unity to Gnome. How do we honor upstreams, you know, um, wishes, but also retain sort of, you know, Ubuntu's um, vision visual identity and also satisfy the the requirements of our users you know will has navigated you know a number of twists and turns in you know ubuntu desktops history and he's done that um particularly well so you know i'm a little bit little bit nervous because you know i've got a tough act to follow there and i think you know with such a solid 1910 release just behind us from last week now it's time to uh, you know, polish that diamond and turn that into 2004. So nothing radical right now, you know, more of the same, just, just polish things. And then after the LTS, then, uh, you know, then as a team, we can look at, you know, the horizon to what will be 2204 and start to think about, you know, what do we want to do over the next two years of development? Um, but certainly for, for me, um, I used to work at Sun Microsystems and also before I joined Canonical, I used to work um, with, you know, Linux servers and data centers and high performance computing and all that sort of thing. So have used ZFS in the data center and I de developed um, a real appreciation for um, the facilities of the ZFS file system and its volume management capabilities and replica replication and encryption and all of that. So I'm delighted to see that tightly integrated on the desktop, albeit under the experimental sort of label at the moment for 1910. And I'm really looking forward to seeing how we build on that for the LTS and beyond and how we can tightly integrate the desktop experience with the really cool features that exist in ZFS. Is there going to be like an integration with, let's say, Naut Nautilus in with the GNOME files? So you would be able to rewind back snapshots. Is that in, is that being planned for uh, like me? Well, right now, I, d I don't know that that kind of capability is going to be available for 2004. In my mind, yes, because I've always thought that, you know, there are a couple of copy on write file systems that could be tightly integrated with file managers and what have you. But what the uh, the guys working on this and the desktop team, uh, this is um, Didier uh, Roche and uh, John Baptiste. Um, they're working on a utility called ZSys. 
that does integrate capabilities like this. So it's, it's event-driven snapshots. So when you do an apt update upgrade, apt install, a kernel upgrade, a, re a distribution release upgrade, snapshots automatically get taken. And those snapshots are available for activation in the boot menu. So if you've done some kind of installation or upgrade and the subsequent boot into that system fails, you can reboot, select your previous system and boot into what was a perfectly functioning system without having to, you know, pick it apart with tweezers and, and, and work out what went wrong. So those sorts of capabilities will be available in 2004. They will be driven through this ZSYS utility, which will sort of abstract some of the complexity in how you manage those multiple data sets that make up, you know, the system file system versus the user data. Um, so that will be the first steps towards that. But yes, I would like to think that we will eventually get to some, you know, um, user friendly graphical tools to, to manage that stuff. So uh, full full disclosure here, I, I haven't gotten around to trying 1910 just yet myself, but um, I believe the other guys have. Uh, I've tried it very briefly in a virtual machine, uh, I'm ashamed to say. Uh, I, I use the, the retro 80s background, which I very much appreciate, and uh, inst installed GNOME Tweaks straight away. <laughs> it was the first thing I did to inst was I installed GNOME Tweaks. Uh, in, in my opinion, it should be there by default, but I'm sure you have your reasons. But uh, um, it's it's just the, the way I... I like to interact with GNOME is I like to have GNOME tweaks as as my uh, as well as the the standard GNOME settings. Uh, also, upon hearing the the news that Will Cook was out, the first joke that came into my mind was "Too many cooks spoil the broth." Um, <laughs> uh, I'm sure that well, has been. To be fair, Will Will isn't out. <laughs> Will has you know got a new job somewhere else. <laughs> you know he's he's chose he's chosen. Yeah, I, I, I'm I'm just I'm te I'm deliberately teasing. I mean I've I've met Will a, a couple of times. Um, it was uh, the last time was at uh, at Fast Talk. And right. he's genuinely one of the nicest guys you'll ever meet. So nothing, no will, ill will against him. No. Nope. Um, hey, Jesus Christ! <laughs> hey, that was you unintentional. Know, you know what? I'm, I'm already. I have to apologize. I put I put the word out into the show notes. It shouldn't have been there. I just thought I was being brief, but obviously, this has taken way too much uh, of a shape on its own. Uh, As it tends to do, it's okay. <laughs> yeah, we are we are professional that way. Uh, I've been trying. Kubuntu, I mean, I'm trying. I basically put Kubuntu before it was 19, before 1910 release, when, like, in the late stages of the beta, I put it on my work computer and started working on it, and it just works. So, uh, you know, that's uh, something I've been quite used to from Ubuntu releases, basically. You just, you just put them on a piece of hardware, and they tend to work. Uh, I would be really surprised if something didn't work. Maybe if I tried the experimental ZFS support, things might get broken. Um, Martin, do you know if uh, what is the first kind of take on of people who try the ZFS support? Does it does it work, or are there any rough edges? Um, well, the reason we've labelled it experimental is we're not certain if the uh, data set layout that we're using for the root file system is what we're going to settle on for the final thing uh, in the LTS. And that may mean that there is not a trivial upgrade path from 1910 to 2004 if you've deployed on ZFS on root. It might be that's all fine, but it might be that we change some things. Um, among people who are familiar with ZFS, they're very excited about this feature. Uh, you know, th this just, just having ZFS available. Um, it's an extremely flexible file system, snapshots aside. But, you know, I'm thinking now my home NAS, I'm going to um, uh, reformat my data partition with ZFS because now I can have multiple snapshots of my operating system data sets and my let's just call it my home directory data set for simplicity, my user data. And I can replicate those multiple snapshots to my local NAS. And now I've got some form of sort of data recovery and backup that's really easy to manage locally. And all of that stuff will be encrypted 
in transit and at rest you know this these are really powerful features of zfs and when you when you start to get into this stuff it's really compelling so i can see uh, foresee some community projects of people making you know this is how you create your own um zfs backup device and this is how you back up your data from your workstations to your you know zfs backup devices and what have you um so i really i really am delighted to see this feature and um you know we we've got some catching up to do to get to quite the same slick implementation we see on the bsds around boot environments but the work that Didier and Jean Baptiste are doing on ZSYS is is getting us very close to that, and I think we're going to get most of the way there for 2004. Um, yeah, it's a really compelling feature, and of course, you know this is this was a big headline feature, but of course the work that the desktop team, particularly Daniel Van Vogt, have done around you know the performance improvements and the fluidity and um, continuity of animations and what have you on the on the GNOME shell. Uh, has also been uh, well reported as, you know, um, a game changer in terms of, you know, the usability of of GNOME. And, you know, that's not something that is specific to Ubuntu. It just so happens we had a developer who likes to wrestle with the complex thorny problems and has got time to do it. Um, but that benefits GNOME users now forevermore on any any Linux distribution. So, you know, there's there's been some harsh words in some quarters said about GNOME and its perceived performance. And it is all about perception in some cases. And, uh, you know, he's done great work to uh, improve in in some small ways, but in lots of different areas small margins and in aggregate it, it results in um, quite a considerable improvement in experience and quality of life i will um, definitely have to check it out i mean i'm um from all the reviews that i've seen and uh, all the goodwill that's out there i'm i'm certainly considering uh distro hopping and on my on, on, on full disclosure on my on my laptop is currently uh endeavor os running xfce and I'm, I'm actually thinking about running or putting 1910 on it um but the last time and i was i was running ubuntu with uh stock ubuntu with gnome um on my laptop um about two or three distros ago and the uh what switched we away from gnome was the was the single process um so if if something froze in in the ui then it, it the my entire system would freeze so i was it wasn't able to multitask and and or kill a process and say okay that's fine you can you can die but i'm i'm currently working on 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 a spreadsheet or i'm working on something in in deeper office but if if my whole system hangs and then, then that's quite quite unfortunate um is there anything that is being worked on in relation to that or is that too ingrained in it and it, it could be something that's um in gnome 4 whenever that comes out so yes certainly uh mutter is largely a single threaded process at the moment but there have been some significant improvements with regards to stability and robustness over uh, the last year or so so those sort of issues that you're describing are uh, uh, certainly few and far between if you do encounter them they tend to be more noticeable if you're running in a wayland session rather than an xorg session and that's one of the reasons why ubuntu still chooses to to uh, ship um, xorg by default for um, the desktop environment because you don't encounter those hard lockups like you do um, if you're running on wayland uh, and yes as far as i'm aware and um, i'm quite new at this so i'm i'm catching up with you know my understanding of you know everything that's going on in the gnome world but as i understand it there are some proposals to um sort of decouple some of that stuff in mutter so that it's not this single threaded thing but i don't know all of those details so maybe 
maybe you need to get one of my colleagues on that really understands that stuff at some point in the future and they can explain it all it's to you. Certainly. Uh, I mean, one of the, the fee- feedbacks that I've, I've, I got was quite recently was actually at an odd camp and somebody was was saying I have a brand new AMD thread ripper with like multiple cores, multiple threads and um, um, bringing up my system resources and seeing one thread just bouncing up and down and thinking I've I've mm-hmm. all of these threads like use them <laughs> um so yeah uh, it's it's uh, it's I'm glad to hear that it'd be it's something that would be worked on and something that um it, it's not only for stability reasons but also taking advantage of the hardware that is in the in the computer that's yeah. running it Certain, certainly in this era you know and certainly what we're seeing from AMD right now it seems that they can just keep you know adding more cores to the fabric of their packages almost um at will and uh between the th- the four of us absolutely spanking intel right now i mean um you know i've i've got all intel equipment except for one machine as i look around in terms of cpus i've got a mixture of gpus um on the shelf there intel and uh, sorry nvidia and amd but you know what what amd have done over the last couple of years they've really brought the game uh to intel and they they're just adding cores for fun now yeah i actually am looking at upgrading my pc quite soon um as soon as i can get more money but uh yeah and because i'm having motherboard problems it's i've narrowed it down to the motherboard it's powering on and off randomly it's just doing a lot of very annoying things takes maybe two or three attempts to boot up that kind of thing so i thought why not just go for a whole new motherboard cpu combination um and yeah ryzen amd ryzen is like the only thing on my list yeah i i built a new machine i built a new machine in january um and i went with um an i9 k in the end i was aware that the new generation of ryzen cpus were being you know talked about in hush whispers you know uh, industry events and what have you but they weren't here then so i went with what was the best for what i wanted to do at the time which was the cpu that i've bought and a motherboard to match and all the rest of it but i have to say if i was building um you know a self-build desktop pc today i would be absolutely definitely looking at um you know an am4 motherboard and a um an amd cpu and I think I would probably still end up choosing an NVIDIA GPU, though, because um, for the things that I uh, am interested in doing, um, I still think that NVIDIA, NVIDIA hold an edge over AMD, even though uh, AMD Radeon have got a much better value proposition than NVIDIA. But for specifically the workloads I'm interested in, NVIDIA um, is higher performance and higher quality in terms of the output i am not this i'm i'm glad to hear that because i just got a laptop with nvidia graphics card in it uh and uh, i just wonder nvidia are they is there i mean they have got a reputation for not um being very friendly for towards the well i'll, I'll start again they apparently it's it's uh, not easy to get Nvidia working with uh, with Wayland or not possible at all. Is this like? Do you know if it's if that's going to change anytime soon? Well, it, it that's kind of a fallacy. So it just so happens that Nvidia chose a, a different way to implement um, the the drivers. So you have to do things differently to accommodate that in Linux. And really, the reason why it's not being adopted is because there was some stubbornness to do things the nvidia way rather than the way everything else worked now as it happens uh mir which is uh, a wayland um you know native wayland compositor that they, they um grew the ability to talk to egl streams um last year sometime so you know if you were using mir as a a wayland compositor then you could um you could do that with the nvidia drivers for some time and my understanding is the other projects are you know getting on board with the fact that there are some accommodations for how you interface with nvidia for supporting wayland and there is some work you know progressing now so that that's going to become more commonplace 
that's great to hear because uh, yeah, I can't see repl- I can't see myself replacing this laptop anytime soon, and I want to be I want the new shiny Wayland thing as well. So, so easy to get tempted. I mean, yeah, my my current PC has a GTX 1070, and it's perfect. It still runs games at high settings. Like, yeah, don't let the market lie to you. We don't have to replace everything every two years, right? Just making the point that I'm running a 750 Ti in this computer. So if if it is if it's still working and it it's outputs at 1080p, which is what my monitor um, outputs at, and it plays the games that I want it to play, uh, I'm perfectly happy with it until it dies. Yeah, essentially. Yeah, and and my requirement for a GPU for games it is isn't all that sophisticated because by and large, if I do play a game, it's usually an emulator for an arcade game from the eighties. But I do like to mess about with um, GPU compute, particularly video encoding. I I don't know why I'm fascinated by this, but I always have been ever since uh, the nineties. I've been interested in you know the coefficients around the MPEG encoding algorithms and I've I've tinkered with it for years and years and years and now you can do that stuff on the GPUs and the shaders and what have you and I continue to be fascinated by this as just a, a sort of um an academic interest really um you know I, I've no reason to be fascinated by it I just I'm perversely interested in it um so yeah I've got these GPUs because I like to do these video encodes and you know objectively what NVIDIA offer there yeah, qualitatively is of higher quality than uh, than what Intel and AMD can produce using similar mechanisms that exist on those packages. So I think uh, I think that's a good place to start wrapping it up. Um, so first off, um, if you would like to buy us a beer, if you're enjoying the podcast, uh, please head on over to linuxlads.com forward slash support and you can pay via PayPal or credit card there if you like um if you want to catch up with us uh you can catch up with us on telegram via linuxlads.com forward slash telegram linuxlads.com forward slash twitter uh facebook.com forward slash linuxlads and on mastodon which is also linuxlads.com forward slash mastodon um you can also email us on show at linuxlads.com um so martin thanks so much for coming on um it was uh, if you want to give us any last shout outs or um any mentions go right ahead uh well um <clears throat> i'm m underscore wimpress on twitter i post all sorts of nonsense there mostly emoji and animated gifs um and uh if you want to hear more of my my stupid words then i do that every week with my friends alan and mark on the ubuntu podcast which you can find at ubuntupodcast.org um and hopefully everyone's running ubuntu so i don't need to pimp that you know the the premier linux desktop distribution (laughs) there may even be a world of wimpy are you still doing that uh yeah i mean uh, everything still gets syndicated through that uh it's wimpy's world i think is the wimpy's world.com so yeah, there's a site there. I haven't done any videos for ages. Uh, the the long and short of it is I'm just far too busy. So even though I've bought equipment and done more pilots and things, I've never actually got round to releasing them. Um, maybe when I retire, maybe when I retire, I'll be a a, a grey bearded YouTube star. <laughs> uh, so we'll <laughs> we'll see how would, that I develops. Would most certainly watch that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like and subscribe. <laughs> and hit the don't forget no you smash the like button and tinkle oh, the bell oh yeah <laughs> getting, getting all fact, the you can't, you can't even you can't even like smash the like button and the subscribe but have you seen what the subscribe button does on youtube now it presents you with a whole bunch of irrelevant options it, it, it's just too complicated i know yeah it's like they're trying to turn youtube into a social network or something it's very strange oh, <laughs> just all you need is Am I subscribed? Am I not subscribed? But now it's, am I subscribed? Am I not subscribed? And what level of bell banging have I done to, you know, decree my level of interest in this channel? It's absolute nonsense. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, well, internet's gone to internet. Um, Yeah, uh, totally. On on that note, uh, I think we'll wrap it up and we shall say goodbye. So, um, as usual, I've been Shane. I've been Connor. I've been Mike. I've been Martin. And we were the Linux lads, plus Martin.
Bye. 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 See you. Goodbye. Bye.